OK, lovely. So I'm going to talk about the magic behind Spark. Um, hopefully, you care about Spark. And if you don't, you can just learn about some interesting design decisions we made uh, and sort of how they make my life kind of bad, but also they give me a job, so whatever. Um, I literally have a flight that I'm running to right after this. So normally, I would stay for questions, but you can DM me on Twitter, uh, and I will try and answer your questions. Um, and Boo, she normally has a special hat for this talk um, to illustrate that it's about magic. Uh, but I forgot the hat in San Francisco. So just pretend that she's wearing this little magic hat uh, because she's a witch. And, and the talk will be much better uh, if you pretend we're, we're just like witches. Um, so I'm Holden. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her. I'm an engineer at IBM Spark Technology Center in San Francisco. Uh, I really like it. They pay me to work on open source. Um, and I'm a Spark committer uh, as of this year, which took a really long time. But it's nice. I can commit my own code without review. And I've worked at a bunch of other companies as well. And I'm a co-author of a few Spark books that I think everyone should own several copies of. Um, specifically, the new one I got a much better royalty deal on. So I think everyone should own several copies of this one. Uh, the other ones, buy them if you want. Uh, if you want to DM me on Twitter, it's just my name, Holden Caro. Uh, and you can also follow me for tweets about America right now, mostly, which are maybe not the happiest. Uh, so I don't know. And, and occasionally functional programming, too. Uh, and pictures of Boo, yeah. Um, and just to be like really clear, like um, this is sort of me outside of the software world. And this is actually what I'm running back to right afterwards. It's San Francisco Pride. Uh, when I get home. So I'm trans, I'm queer, I'm an immigrant, uh, I, I work in America, and I'm part of the leather community. Um, and just like, we should be nice to each other, right? We all write the same shitty Scala code. Um, if you write distributed systems code, we all deal with the same network partitions. And AWS continues to, uh, I'm not supposed to say, never mind, I work for IBM. Um, IBM Cloud continues to have wonderful networking, as always. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this is my employer. It's the IBM Spark Technology Center in San Francisco. Uh, we have this lobby with a lot of green stuff in it, which is the same color as a passing Jenkins build. So I like to think that our lobby illustrates that we write only the finest PRs. Um, I don't actually know what my manager was going for in this slide. Uh, but if you buy things from IBM, please keep doing that uh, and tell me what they are. Um, uh, yeah, I, I love my job. I work on open source. I don't know how we make money. Um, but we do, I think. I really hope we do. Um, and you should keep buying our stuff. Um, so I'm hoping you're all nice people. You laughed at some of my sort of corny jokes, so we're off to a pretty good start. Um, I'm really curious. How many people have no idea what Apache Spark is? OK, cool. How many people have never used Apache Spark? OK, that's a lot more people. Um, so for the people that have never used Apache Spark, uh, I really hope this talk doesn't dissuade you from using it. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the magic, but we're also going to focus on the places where the magic breaks. Um, and, and just remember, all distributed systems are crap. Um, and so uh, just because we're talking about the parts of Spark which are crap doesn't mean that it is more crappy than other distributed systems. Uh, everything is terrible. Somehow we still make software. Um, and I'm hoping everyone's familiar-ish with Scala, because the examples are in Scala. Um, yeah, so Spark is awesome. It's general purpose. Um, most people come to Spark from writing MapReduce jobs. And I love the people that come to Spark from MapReduce because it sets the bar really, really low. Um, and we're just like, yeah, we're, we are faster than MapReduce. Um, I, I like to joke that you could learn a Spark, how to write a new Spark job in about the time it takes your MapReduce job to finish running. Uh, and if you work at a big enough company, this, this actually could be possible. Um, the other we reason people come to Spark is they're like, oh, crap, my, my data doesn't fit in my laptop anymore. 
I know, I'm going to use distributed systems. Um, and that's really not the point when you should be doing the cutover to distributed systems. Um, it's when it no longer fits in the largest box you can buy on Amazon. Uh, sorry, IBM Cloud. Um, yeah, I should, I should be better at this. Um, but if you want to start using Spark earlier on, that's fine, too. It, it makes it easier for me to convince people to keep paying me. So that's, that's great. Um, and the other reason why I think people come to Spark is it has a nice functional inspired API. Um, I mean, certainly our approach to types has been uh, interesting as well. Um, and so it's not, it's not like all magic, but there's some cool magic. And that's, that's why some people come to Sparkland. So the, the core building block of most of Spark's magic is that on Spark's distributed collections, um, there's, there's two of them, RDDs and data frames. Uh, and they're both, they're both lazily evaluated. Um, and what this means is Spark delays computation, and it sort of builds up either a graph, or if you want to think about it as a query plan, it can build up a query plan of what we're asking Spark to do. And then it's able to do a whole bunch of really cool optimizations on this graph of operations. Um, and this is really important if you're coming from MapReduce, uh, because you spend a lot of time thinking about how to combine your operations together so that you're not doing a lot of passes over the data. Um, but this magic lets us, you know, the optimizer takes care of it. And when the optimizer fails, I just blame the optimizer and I don't bother fixing my own code. Um, the other thing which, which is kind of cool is Spark is resilient. Um, distributed systems are crap, mostly because computers are pretty bad when you have thousands of them. Um, and then when you have network on top of that, it, it just gets really bad. Um, and Spark has an interesting resilience model. Um, unlike MapReduce, where they just write things out to a bunch of different machines, and they go like, if I lose like two machines, that's OK. I can find my data on a third machine. Life is going to be fine. Um, Spark says, eh, writing data to disk is kind of slow. I'm just going to keep this plan that I've been building for my optimizer. And if something goes wrong, I'll just recompute my missing pieces of data. Um, and so this is really cool. Um, the other one is like we've got this nice like in memory and spill to disk. Um, so if you have like too much data that even on like 200 nodes in Amazon doesn't fit in memory, will still succeed. Um, and there's some other cool pieces of magic. Um, yeah, so RDDs are Spark's initial distributed collection API. Um, they support arbitrary Java objects. Um, so if it's serializable, you can put it in, RD, in an RDD. Uh, note that does not mean you should put it in an RDD. You could, strictly speaking, make an RDD of random number generators. That would be an interesting decision. Um, Spark's data frames uh, looked at that and said, yeah, Java serialization was really not like an A-team choice. Um, what can we do that's better? Uh, and we said, well, maybe we don't have to let people make distributed collections of arbitrary objects. Uh, maybe if we make people make distributed collections of objects that like make sense. Um, and so data frames do that. Uh, we also threw out types um, temporarily, and I feel really bad about that, but I blame someone else for that piece of the code. Um, and then data sets went, ooh, ooh, no, 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 types were good. Let's put those back in. Um, and so we should all just use data sets and pretend data frames never existed uh, unless, you know, you're in the Python world. Um, right. So, so the cool thing is that this, this graph this directed acyclic graph is built up for us by free, uh, for free. We can write just normal functional transformations like maps and flat maps and filters, and, and Spark will build this query plan for us. We don't consciously, explicitly build a query plan. Um, and this is, this is powered by the fact that RDDs and data frames don't really exist in a classic sense of the word, right? Like, I can have an RDD of random number generators, but until I actually do something with that RDD and force it to write those uh, results out to disk, Spark doesn't bother creating that RDD of random number generators, which is really good, because that was a not very smart RDD. Um, they're really just plans of, of how this works. Um, and this is great for performance. The, the only downside is it's terrible for debugging, um, because, yeah. You, you get errors later on. They make no sense. That's another talk that will also dissuade you from using Spark. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to put debugging on the side and pretend the magic works. Um, this is what 
a really simple DAG looks like. Um, it's just different things happening. Um, stage boundaries are when Spark has to copy data between different machines. Uh, and so all of these things can be combined together onto a single stage for us. And we can actually go and look at this graph and see if Spark's optimizer is doing the reasonable things or if it's decided to do something a little out there. Um, and if you're working in data frames, you get a very similar graph, except it has a little bit more information that you can't read because it's fuzzy, but trust me, there's a little more information about what's happening, and we can, we can look at the, the query plan. Um, so yeah, this would not be a big data talk if I did not have the word count example. Um, they threatened to take away my license if I did not show you the word count example. Um, and this licensing bureau is totally not a thing I made up in my head. Um, I promise. Uh, so we've got our standard word count example. And just, just the point is, all of the steps until we get to here have just been making this, this directed acyclic graph for us. Everything up until this point has been making our query plan. And when we get to here and we save our file out to a distributed file system and we call it snoop um, after Boople snoop, uh, this is where we actually do our evaluation. Um, and this, this is pretty nice, right? It's, it's not too bad. Um, word count is not super exciting, though, so we'll, we'll not put too much effort into it. So what's awesome about this, right? We, we get pipelining for free. Um, we can do really interesting optimizations by delaying the work. Uh, if you have things which are like temporarily too big to fit in memory, but then you combine them right down afterwards, we'll pipeline that combining step as much as possible. Um, and this is pretty awesome. And we, we sort of use this DAG in two places. We use it to recompute failure and also for our optimizations. But the, there's, there's limitations to our magic. Um, the biggest one is that Spark, at the end of the day, is not a compiler. Um, it also doesn't use Scala macros. We don't, we don't know what you're doing beyond your action. So if we, if we go back here, um, Spark can see everything that's happened before this, but it has no idea what's coming after this. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we can't see into the future, and this, this limits what we can do. Um, the other part is, because we take arbitrary Scala functions, you can do anything you want inside of those, and Spark has no idea what you're doing inside of those arbitrary Scala functions. So you could do something inside of your Scala functions which would make sense to pipeline if we knew what was happening inside of your Scala function. But since Spark doesn't understand the Scala functions itself, it only understands the operations that are happening, um, it's, it's limited there. Uh, and I mean, it's terrible to debug, but uh, it's, it's not the end of the world. All distributed systems are terrible to debug. If you find one that doesn't suck, let me know, because, you know, this job is good, but yeah, anyways. Um, so the TLDR is we are not Marty McFly. Did they have Back to the Future here? OK, yeah. So the TLDR is we're not Marty McFly. I can't like go to the future, see what's going to happen, jump in my DeLorean, go back, and like run my code. Um, I thought that would be more funny than it was. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I like DeLorean jokes. I guess that's just not a thing. They had DeLoreans here, right? Or was that America? That was America. OK. DeLoreans are terrible. Um, Anyways, yeah, the other thing about Spark and the reason why we use distributed systems like Spark is that our data is distributed. If we didn't need this part of Spark, there, there would be no real reason to use it, right? Um, we just write things with normal Scala collections, and our life would be boring but pretty safe and easier to understand. Um, and essentially what this comes down to is at some point we force Spark to make our, make our data exist, right? It's like that lazy 16-year-old that's promised you they've taken out the garbage, um, and eventually we go and we check and we see the garbage is still there and the 16-year-old takes out the garbage, or in Spark's case, it runs our distributed computing job. Um, and at that point, Spark like, tries to find our data um, and split it up into a whole bunch of different pieces for us. And that's, that's awesome. And for the most part, we can ignore the part where our data is magically distributed. We can pretend it's just 300 gnomes. Um, and each gnome has a little piece of the phone book or more likely uh, our ad click data, because 
that seems to be what people like to do to make money. Um, and each gnome is going to do its work on its own. And we don't have to worry about you know, which gnome is handling which pieces of data. Spark does a pretty good job. The catch is that we have these things called partitioners in Spark. And partitioners are deterministic. Um, and this, this has a lot of really nice properties. Like deterministic code is generally like, yay. Non-deterministic code is generally, hmm. Um, but there's, there's, some, there's some notable exceptions. And one of them is if we try and send all of the data to one of these gnomes, because we have a deterministic partitioner, that gnome is going to get very sad. Um, the best case scenario is the gnome gets drunk, passes out, and then wakes up the next day and gives us their book report. Um, the worst case scenario is the gnome dies. Um, don't worry, they come back when the cluster restarts. Um, the gnome dies, and then we go, oh, that gnome died. I'm going to give all that work to another one of my gnomes. And then we do this until we've killed a few gnomes. And then we go, OK, maybe we should stop killing gnomes um, for a little bit. And, and then we restart our job, and, and like this sad. Um, so right, key skew to the anti-rescue, um, and this is this is the sad piece, um, and I think it's sad because like it's it, in retrospect super obvious. Um, key skew happens in almost all of our data, um, data with humans, uh, zip code, postal code. If you you know do aggregations based on that, we tend to group together in cities. Um, if it's computer data, computers seem to tend to group together in the record called null. Um, they're, it's their favorite record, and and we can we can have unbalanced partitions. Um, and I think actually one of one of the frustrating things about this is we can have key skew, and our job can succeed because we don't give that one gnome quite enough work for them to die, but we give them enough work that they take twice as long as the rest of the gnomes, and then we end up just waiting unnecessarily. Um, so my favorite example for this uh, from, I think we were talking about mustaches in the last talk a little bit, is if I want to get out of software and open an artisanal mustache wax shop uh, in San Francisco, I might want to collect some information about where people with handlebar mustaches live. Um, and I don't see enough handlebar mustaches in this room to open my mustache wax shop uh, here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on some zip codes in America. Um, so let's say I buy some information about handlebar mustaches from a valued partner, um, Experian, uh, and then I, I do some aggregates. Um, the problem is, the first thing that I might want to do is sort my data. That's, that's pretty reasonable. Um, but the problem is that makes Spark sad, because this, uh, we can think of each box as being one gnome, one box to gnome. And so this gnome has too much data to look after. It can't keep track of all of the handlebar mustaches. And in retrospect, this is very obvious. The San Francisco Mission District, which is represented by the zip code, has a lot of handlebar mustaches. If someone asked me to keep track of all of the handlebar mustaches in the mission, I would fail, um, much like our distributed system has failed. OK. Some people like this, not so much. Um, the, the trick, the, the solution to this deterministic partitioner is we, we introduce noise in our key, and then things just magically work. Um, but you, you might be going, hold on, this sounds like a terrible, going back to the last talk, this sounds like a terrible design. You write terrible software. Please, please don't do this. Um, and oh, well, OK, I thought I had a side explaining why we did this. Uh, we don't. Um, but it's, it's not entirely, it's not just that we write bad software, right? Uh, deterministic partitioners give us lots of nice things. If I want to join my data, um, knowing where it is means that I don't have to do a reshuffle, right? Like, if I want to join things which have the same key, I need to put them on the same machine. That's just how life goes at, at the end of the day. Um, and so these deterministic partitioners make sense. The problem is, we don't actually always need them, right? Like when I've sorted my data, I don't really care that all of the stuff for the same key is on the same machine. I just want my data in order. Um, but because they both use the same underlying mechanism in Spark, which is the shuffle service, we end up having this property that, that things are sad unless we introduce some noise to our key. Um, yeah, and so we can combine this with Spark's arbitrary lambda functions to make our code even more sad. Um, or as I like to say it, there is a worse way to do word count. Um, and let's look at that. 
Um, so the worst way to do word count is to use this thing called group by key, and then this is the map values. So if Spark understood what was happening here, right, like if Spark could see inside of our lambda expression here, Spark would say, oh, you're just computing the sum of this group. I'm going to take that sum, and I'm just going to move it up, and life is going to be fine. But the problem is, all Spark knows is we have some, you know, we have some bytecode here. Um, it has no idea what that bytecode is trying to do, and so the optimizer can't save us from ourselves in this case. Um, and this, this is frustrating because I'm a lazy software developer. I don't want to have to think about what I'm doing. Um, yeah, okay, group by key is, is bad. Um, so if you're, if you're working in Spark's old RDD API, the answer is you can express your aggregations using reduce by key or aggregate by key, where you explicitly state that, like, I want to combine my data for all of the things with the same key. This is what I want you to do. And then Spark can say, oh, I understand what you're asking me to do, and it can do optimizations, and it's really awesome. Um, that's, that's OK. Um, but the other nicer fix, in my mind, is Spark's dataset API. Um, and this is where I try and convince you to learn yet another DSL uh, for writing software, which I hope to trick at least one of you into learning it. Um, you can still use your arbitrary lambda expressions in the cases where the DSL doesn't do what you want it to do. Uh, but the nice thing is, when you write things with the data set DSL, Spark understands what's happening inside of your functions. Um, and then it can do good things for us. Uh, and group by is, is especially interesting. Um, and there's, there's a lot of other fun bits. Um, so here's an example. Um, I care a lot about pandas. Um, and one of my examples is I like information about pandas, but I really just don't want to pretend that there's any sad pandas in the world. So the first thing that I'm going to do is filter those out. And I'm, then I'm going to do my computation afterwards, and I'm going to figure out how fuzzy all of the happy pandas are in the world. Um, and this is cool. And, and I could totally write my filter expression with an arbitrary Scala function if I wanted to. Um, but because I've written it with Spark's little happy DSL here, Spark is able to see that I only care about happy pandas. And then if our data is partitioned, or if our data is in like a SQL server or something like this, it'll push that operation down to the data store, and it'll simply avoid loading the data that I don't need. And I can really pretend that there's no sad pandas in the world. Um, and this, is, this makes a huge performance difference. And if you want to do this in the RDD API, you actually have to consciously think about how your data is partitioned. And whenever I put consciously think and how my data is partitioned together, that means my code runs really slow because I forgot to take a look at that. Um, or at least that's me. Um, and yeah, OK, arbitrary Scala code. Yay! So um, this example is slightly nicer, albeit somewhat cut off. Um, and so this is, this is the part where it's like, we don't just have to put it at the end. We can have an arbitrary map statement in the middle, and types work. Yay, types. I thought more people would be happy about types. Um, but th so I like this because uh, at the end of the day, like I could write this expression in Spark SQL's DSL, but that would involve a lot of thinking. And really, it's not going to be able to do anything particularly smart with that. Um, so writing it as a Scala Lambda doesn't lose me anything. Um, and it can be so much faster. Um, Bigger numbers are bad, smaller numbers are good. Um, unless you really like burning CPU cycles, in which case I have an IBM cloud contract for you. Um, so we can see RDD group by key performs very bad, poorly because Spark's optimizer really has no idea what the hell we're asking it to do. Uh, with aggregate by key, where we've given the optimizer some hints, it still performs pretty well. Um, but we can see that for uh, the data frame version, or data set version, it performs even better than that. And that's because Spark has an even more understanding of what's happening uh, when we do this in data sets. Um, and so what, what, power, what magical powers do we imbue our optimizer with by constraining ourselves to this DSL? Uh, and constraining us away from Java objects. 
uh, which I think is the other really important part. Um, and so it turns out like we, we can sort on the serialized data. That's awesome. Um, because Spark has its serializer that is actually designed for distributed computing, we, we care about being able to do operations on our data when it's serialized. Uh, because it turns out while network is expensive, serializing and deserializing Java objects really isn't all that inexpensive either. Um, we can understand the aggregations that are happening uh, at a much better level, and we can perform many aggregations at the same time. Um, we get a more efficient representation of our data. Uh, there's a benchmark from a vendor that, I mean, it's a vendor benchmark. It's probably bullshit. Uh, but it has a kernel of truth in it, and it can show that it's faster than even cryo serialization. Ooh, I'm getting push notifications about my flight. Um, so what are the relational transformations like? What, what are the operations we can do if we come into this new world? Um, so all of our old friends, like all of our filters, joins, maps, uh, these things are still here. You can still write your beautiful Scala code. We love you. Um, and we get some new ones. Uh, if you really like, does anyone like writing SQL expressions? <gasps> Four people, um, you can write your SQL expressions against these. Does anyone really like SQL 92? One person, but you didn't like SQL. I'm confused. OK, well, this may be the throwback to the 90s you've been looking for. Um, uh, we have a SQL parser um, that someone was like, yeah. The old spec is free. <laughs> um, and so that's pretty great. Uh, the other one, which I think is awesome, are window functions. Um, and I'm just going to talk about window functions for a second because I think they're amazing. Um, and if you come from like working on a single node, window functions are like the least impressive thing ever. Uh, but if you work on distributed systems, you're like, oh my god, this is so cool. Uh, or if you're like a nerd and you work on distributed systems. Um, so window functions are just like, I have this sliding window over my data. I want to compute like the average as, as these records are coming in, or I want to compute this average historically in these like five-day sliding windows. Um, and that's really easy to do on a single machine, but when our data is split up between all of these different machines, in Spark's RDD model, I, I, the magic distribution thing goes away because I have to think about how my data is split between these different machines to compute my window, right? Like I have to compute some of it and then pass that to the next time and I have to do multiple iterations and it's, it's very icky. But the, the window function in Spark SQL does all of that for me, and I can pretend that my magical distributed system isn't a pile of questionable Scala code, um, and that everything works, and life isn't terrible. Um, we also get a new group by, uh, which is really exciting if, once again, you, you spend a lot of time writing distributed systems. Um, so if, if you notice, like, reduce by key and aggregate by key, you can, you can write things in them, but you're sort of manually, ah. Oh, God, this flight is soon. Um, you're sort of manually specifying how to combine the data, and that's important, um, whatever. Uh, but if I want to compute a bunch of aggregates at the same time, I'm going to end up keeping track of like six different variables and combining them at the end and computing one of my aggregates incorrectly. Um, and I probably won't notice until we start doing something with my data and I start recommending very inappropriate objects. Uh, or items, items, uh, to people, and then uh, I need to find a new job. Um, so instead, I can use this group data structure. Um, and, and this, okay, this maybe isn't impressive unless you've worked with Spark's old API, but like, oh my god, this is so much simpler, I promise you. Um, normally, we would spend a lot of time talking about some of the limitations. Um, but just remember, anyone who comes to you and says, I have this new magical DSL, it fixes everything, is lying, including me. Um, so there are some limitations. They're going to be sad. If you want to learn this DSL, some caveats apply. Um, there's some videos. Yay! Uh, oh, right, no, but the most important part is buy this book. Oh. oh, it says soon. No, no, no. It's available now. You can buy it today. You can give me your money today, I promise. Uh, not me, your money. You can give O'Reilly your money and they'll give me like a dollar um, afterwards and I can use that to buy a fourth of a coffee in San Francisco. Um, so I've got some other upcoming talks. Uh, they're in places, um, but really, thank you for listening. I'm sorry to cut this short, but I want to go catch my flight so I don't miss San Francisco pride. Uh, Y'all been awesome.